Coming up on Digital Music Trends 221 on the 25th of February 2015, Snapchat's music feature, Apple's editorial strategy and potential for disruption, MTV's apps, brand-sponsored videos on YouTube, the Aim and Break GoFundMe campaign, UK Music's manifesto and much more. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Leonelli and this is a weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and DMT is available on both an audio and a video format, I realized I hadn't mentioned the video uh, in a few weeks uh, but it is it is available if you're an audio listener you can go on YouTube or find it as a download uh, in podcast form and if you like to receive uh, a weekly mail out so that you know when the show's out uh, you can sign up on bit.ly slash DMT list, again it's bit.ly slash DMT list and this week it's a real pleasure to welcome to the show Darren Hemmings, the founder of digital marketing agency Motive Unknown. So hi Darren and thanks for joining me this week, it's just the two of us, so it should be a fun one. I know, it's like a date. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the world's worst date. <laughs> <laughs> the most disappointing date you can ever go on. I know, yeah. Well done, you uh, scored. I, I, I've seen like a, a, a really... Uh, uh, terrifying video of a, a Guardian uh, show that they're doing uh, and it's like a Google Glass experiment uh, where they're sending people on dates uh, both of them wearing Google Glass and then they create a show out of that by showing the point of view I guess of the date of the dating person uh, yeah it's, it's so it sounds bizarre. like an unfunny version of Peep Show <laughs> kind of, yes, exactly. It's just really cringeworthy. So yeah, if anybody's yeah. interested in that, it's got nothing to do with music, but you can go and check that out on the Guardian side. Uh, and, uh, but uh, uh, this week there's a few stories to talk about, but nothing major, so we can have a bit of fun with it. And I think uh, the first thing to talk about would be, uh, I wanted to just uh, talk about Snapchat for, for a few minutes. Uh, uh, the, the, the app in an update that was rolled out uh, uh, um, like a couple of weeks back, uh, 10 days ago, uh, has introduced the ability for users uh, to add a soundtrack to their videos by recording the music that is playing in the background on their phones so essentially if you're playing uh, the idea is that if you're playing um, something on iTunes then you can uh, pick up the Snapchat app uh, record a video and the music that you're playing will end up uh, as a background to the video uh, and so uh, you know this is an interesting feature because it, it kind of shows them moving into the uh, music space and, and the CEO actually uh, said that uh, they're interested in, in the music space as well uh, it is a little bit sketchy because obviously a lot of Snapchat videos are uh, made to be temporary, but uh, uh, there's no uh, you know information on the site about licensing talks or anything like that. So uh, it kind of a little bit sketchy on, on the licensing side, but a, a cool move and, and potentially something that could disrupt some of the other companies that are working in the in the uh, music messaging space. So what what do you make of the of this uh, 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 Snapchat feature? And do you think that it, it's it's just a it's just a feature, or is it, does it say something more about the company's strategy? Um, I, th- I mean, I think it's a really interesting feature. I must admit, there was a part of me who was kind of like, so clearly this app is picking up the audio routing through the device, which kind of left me wondering why more apps don't do that. Right. Because I was used to get that with Shazam. Right. Do you ever have it when you were playing something on? like a mixtape or something, and I wanted to try and Shazam it, and you realize you can't because yeah. Shazam can't pick up the audio currently playing on your device. It has to use the mic uh, and all this sort of thing. So there was part of me was sort of briefly uh, distracted by the fact that it was, uh, you know, the, 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 the sort of technical uh, implementation and, and how other apps could maybe yeah. work with that. Um, I think it's very interesting. I mean, it, it raises a kind of curious point to me about, the way in which kind of music pop, permeates popular culture. Um, but I, I feel like particularly around messaging apps, it feels like it's currently slightly locking out the people that might try and make money from it, which right. to some extent I think threads back into a just an ever-growing sort of schism between those that own the rights to these things and want to make money from them and those that just want to talk with their friends and and use that music and talk about that music, but without necessarily paying someone yeah. for that. And so I think Snapchat's a perfect case in point where it's, you know, able to use the the video currently playing and uh, and all those sorts of things. But, you know, it, 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 being a, a marketing person, I'm forever looking at how you might be able to kind of leverage that. And uh, yeah. And just as with, you know, for, for a while with Instagram, and to some extent still with Instagram, it's sort of like it doesn't play well to marketers because you can't link out to other sites. You can't sort of manage multiple accounts. You can't, you know, there's a lot of things you can't do. Um, 
but but equally the flip side is that it makes it entirely a sort of organic you know user-led experience that yeah. doesn't get muddied by people like me trying to push my uh, uh artist of choice upon you so I think it's a sort of interesting sign of the times, really. Uh, you know, people are using this music. I think messaging apps, you know, anyone that reads the, the Daily Digest that I do sort of knows that I keep banging on about how messaging apps are, to me, are, are, are showing every potential of, you know, I, I was liking them to being potentially a bit like the mobile phone, in that the mobile phone when it first arrived was literally just a phone. It was the, you right. know, the, the, the USP of a mobile was that you could walk anywhere with it and make a call. And now, you know, this thing is your camera, it's your email, it's everything. And the fact that it's a phone is now almost last on a list of uh, 25 things that you use it for. Yeah. And I wonder with the messaging apps, you know, you're seeing these emerging trends where, <clears throat> you know, some of them had started music services. Uh, I think it's Line in Japan had started a grocery delivery service that was sort of grown out from the, the messaging Um and I think they're realizing that you can actually tack on no end of additional things to this, yeah. such that uh, people live much more in the messaging apps. And it's that general move from sort of public social network posts to much more private ones that are shared between fewer people and aren't visible by everyone else. And so, yeah, yeah it's, it's a sort of interesting sign of the times to me. You know, it's, it's a funny one because... You know, you and I will sit here and discuss things relative to their potential to make money for people and, you know, all those kinds of things. It's kind of more from an industry side. Yeah. But I feel like the Snapchat uh, music function is is sort of not an industry thing. It's, uh, yeah. you know, they've been clever because, as yeah. you said, you know, videos are unlikely to exceed 30 seconds anyway. And therefore, I'm assuming these videos uh, would all fall under kind of safe harbor of, of you know, sub 30 second sample length where nobody is due a royalty payment um, i mean it's 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 funny from a lasting po point of view because uh, obviously if you <coughs> if you're linking music to videos as the youtube youtube teaches it doesn't really matter if it's under 30 seconds i think it's you know the the, the rights owner in theory could still claim for it you know even if you have a youtube video that is 20 seconds with with a sound garden track then the label can still claim the advertising of the back of it if it's getting a lot of hits uh the interesting thing is how you value a video that has a sound garden track that is sent from one person to another person and that disappears right after the other person watches it mm. and then how you iterate that licensing to provide for the stories function of snapchat where you where some of the stuff can actually survive uh mm. that the, the sort of direct messaging original function and, and actually be seen by more people and so uh, and also on, on the technical side like you said how do you actually gauge who the artist is that is playing because it is grabbing it from somewhere in your phone can it also grab the metadata from it and then account for who is being played because that's definitely uh, even if they don't pay anything that's information that it'd be helpful to the industry to know uh uh it's funny, isn't it? Because it, it feels like, you know, <laughs> we've spent so long wrangling with, like, content ID on YouTube and stuff. Yeah. Which, by comparison to the scenario you've just described on Snapchat, looks like a, a total cakewalk, doesn't it? To just <laughs> exactly, sort of find yeah. a song, fingerprint a song, and then claim it. You know, with this, it's like you're trying to chase something that's like smoke. You know, it's sort of there one minute and gone the next. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if at, at this particular point the major label lawyers are sort of throwing their hands in the air and be like, <laughs> I have no idea where we even begin with this one. Not a clue. Let's wait until something sticks its head above the parapet so that it's uh, you know in the public domain for longer yeah. than 24 hours and then we sue them. <laughs> then we'll go that route. Yeah, That's let's wait until Snapchat IPOs. To, you know, it's like they, they've got to put Snapchat over a barrel to find a solution that would then pay otherwise they'll they'll just sue and want tons of money or whatever but yeah yeah it, it does make the uh the current sort of uh, content identity issues uh look like uh, no no problem at all by comparison and and i feel i feel old already because i i never really became uh enamored with snapchat and it was sort of something that kind of passed me by a little bit i mm. uh, i don't yeah, know yeah I, I i tried it <sighs> nah, i've didn't, got didn't it really <laughs> Is it an age thing? We just have we have we aged to a point where there is nothing in my life that I need to share a ten second snapshot of. 
I don't get. I'm not in a club <laughs> off my tits going, oh, Andrea, look at this, this is amazing. You won't believe what I'm doing now. No, I'm like at home with a pipe and slippers. There's, yeah. no, there's nothing I can report in 10 seconds. It's worth knowing. <laughs> and, that you want, that, and that you want to be deleted after that. Yeah, I mean, you know, wouldn't that be great if yeah. there was 10 seconds of my life that was deletable? No, <laughs> it doesn't work like that. But like, weirdly, I, I have to say, I mean, I've always been a little bit circumspect about messaging apps. Um, yeah. But lately, I've I've gotten very into WhatsApp. Yeah. And, uh, I love the groups function on WhatsApp. And uh, I've got a, a thing I've just created with a few friends of mine. <laughs> and, and it's interesting because it's slightly reinvigorated my passion for music in a roundabout way. So basically, I've got a group with a few mates of mine that we've just called the Hip Hop Tip Off. Nice. <laughs> And basically, we just share like songs and albums that you, we should be checking out. And you know, it sort of varies because we're all forty or thereabouts, so we, you know, it's old music and new. Um, but it's just a really kind of nice way to take a conversation that's not on my work email, that's not lost amid Facebook posts. I mean, it could be a Facebook group just as easily, I'm sure. Yeah. But this one just felt a bit more immediate. Yeah. And a bit more direct because it's ostensibly texting. Um, But yeah, I, and I, I really like that now. It's uh, it's become because it's it's made me, you know. It, uh, I mean, I think uh, like most, I, I I definitely suffer from the sort of tyranny of choice problem around Spotify and, yeah. and everything else, where I just wind up playing the same damn records because I just can't <laughs> navigate that whole area of what I should be listening to. And my taste in music were always a little bit more edgy than most. So until Spotify starts pulling out like Diamond D records or uh, or grindcore, then I'm unlikely to be too uh, bowled over by Spotify's editorial, um, which is a, a comment on me, not on them. I should ha should add. Yeah, But yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, so for for that, it's been great. And I think that sort of private messaging and just the fact that it's not costing you 10p every time, and that you can text a bunch of people at once and have a sort of conversation with. Well, in WhatsApp, it's up to a hundred people in theory. Um, I really like, and, it, and yeah. I think it's it does show that flip side to social networking, where that is technically social networking, but it's private and it's not noisy. You know, my my phone isn't buzzing every five seconds with messages. You know, you'd be lucky if there's one a day yeah. because it's just and stuff it's also, you listen to and is a filtered feed. So, yeah, it's also kind of like a good way to create groups of people that you might not necessarily be friends with on Facebook as well. Uh, like, for example, at our uni, we have a group of of my class, a law school, where. Uh, we all can message about what's going on or if there's anybody's got any questions on the course and stuff and and that's nice because you know we wouldn't necessarily all be bffs on facebook or want to see uh, you know all the people in yeah. the class facebook feeds but uh, on whatsapp you just have to get the number and that's it you know you don't have any more obligations than that so uh, yeah that's right i mean it's, it's always uh, a, it's a little bit scary because it, that means also means that anybody that has your number also has access to more information about you like your photo and stuff like that uh so there's that aspect to it as well but uh i guess you know <laughs> yeah i think it's funny i think because i run my own company i've sort of long i've long stopped worrying about yeah me stuff too like that. i mean exactly i don't sort of wildly opinionate about things because we <laughs> We have clients, and, and and you never know who you'll wind up working with. Yeah. Uh, so I'm more uh, cautious these days about kind of openly um, slamming bands and things like that because certainly it's happened before where I've done that and then wound up working with their management or whatever. <laughs> I mean, I think to be honest, most people realise that it's music. We all have taste, and you know, you're, you're welcome to dislike things. It's, it's probably how vehemently you you hate on them, but uh, but yeah, I mean, outside of that, I don't tend to worry about it too much, but. Uh, I could understand why other people definitely would, yeah. you know, depending on what your avatars are and, you know, what your message next to your WhatsApp profile <laughs> is. Mine just says, fax me on my yacht. Right. <laughs> so that's as good as it's going to get from me. I couldn't bear to see another, hey, I'm using WhatsApp status update. So I thought I'd just write any old crap. But, uh, But yes, you mentioned that you mentioned curation, actually. That's that's a good segue for uh, talking about uh, Apple and uh, an interesting job post that they, they uh, kind of came up this week uh, that was spotted by Music Ally, where mm. they are looking for uh, an opening for what is called an editorial producer on, on the site of Apple's, uh, you know, job listings. But essentially, it is a, a music journalist uh, uh, or more than a music journalist, a music editor uh, to a certain extent. It feels like They want somebody that can write, but also that can manage uh, a stable of freelance writers and commission pieces and sort of uh, manage the whole process. So uh, interesting posting because you, you don't really know if it's open to uh, an experienced music journalist or if they're actually targeting, say, the editor of Enemy or some, somebody sort of more high profile that they can poach from one of those, one of those sites. Uh, and, and sort of a lot of people have made 
this out to be a reinforcement uh, of the notion that Apple is going after uh, uh, curation, that they're going to be more aggressive on that than they've been so far with just the, the features on the, on the pages and they're going to actually have written content, which could be actually incredibly important for bands because, you know, uh, people do check out iTunes a lot and uh, Although the scope is unclear, I mean, I, I was wondering if this would be something like the old music guide, where all the reviews are sort of, you know, they, they can have an opinion, but it has to be a very mild opinion, whether positive mm. or negative, and there's not going to be any like one-star reviews on iTunes just because it, it wouldn't be okay as a retailer to do that. I, I don't know what you, your thoughts are on that. Um. Well, I mean, you know, first of all, I think it's interesting. Actually, I have to say, absolutely, before I do anything else. The tip-off for this was Matthew Horn. Right. It was, it was Matt Horn who who spotted it. It was a bit awkward because he sent it to me and Stu Dredge, um, and and Stu wrote about it. So then I included it in the digest, and then I think various other people have picked up on it. But it sort of it raised this interesting issue of like, do you credit Matt for it? Because sometimes <laughs> people don't want to be credited. Yeah, and exactly. Matt, Matt, I don't I think Matt never quite came back and confirmed one way or the other because me and Stu were quite happy to say hat tip to 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 matt for uh for 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 bringing this up but so uh on the basis that no one else has done it i'm doing it now just so that my conscience is clear Excellent. um i think it's very interesting i mean i um i love i love the notion that apple might switch to a or, or, or you know introduce a level whereby there's much more of a qualitative um, celebration of music and much more of a decent editorial. I mean, I, th I think they could navigate a water where, as you said, they probably avoid getting too bitchy. And, and I suspect it would be more uh, celebrating the catalogue that they have to offer. Right. Uh, which, I, you know, I'll be honest, I'm all for. Like, I don't really need to read articles about why I shouldn't play BDI and things like that. And I remember, you know, on Drowned in Sound, there was someone wrote, I mean, Derek Robertson or something like that, wrote a proper hatchet job review of the bdi record but it, it created a bit of a furor because everyone kind of was like well why write the article you've just sort of gleefully written this one star you know attack on the band and it's right. just like uh you know if you haven't got anything to say don't say anything at all you know if you really hate it that much why are you reviewing it and i and i, I sort of get it you know i mean it's entertaining to read and it was funny as well and things like that but i think in apple's case it's much more that they could uh run editorial that just operates as quality music journalism yeah you know i like the quietus i'm a huge fan of the quietus and <clears throat> the quietus never write bitchy pieces that i'm i'm aware of but they write a lot of stuff that leaves you thinking oh i need to go and check this out because that's a really great interview with whomever, you know, and I want to go and, re and find out more about them. And, I, and, and that was a big part of my musical upbringing was, you know, the marriage of music journalism with the music itself. Yeah. And the, and the journalism selling you on who the artist was and their vision and all those sorts of things. Um, and often it'd be, you know, a better job being done of that than, than these days where, so, where artists are sort of doing it themselves through social media in a manner that's frequently quite stripped of the kind of depth and the art that would genuinely connect them uh, with you, you know, so um, I think there's a huge potential for that, and it, it, it sort of dovetails into this whole thing lately of the. Of, I mean, I wouldn't say it's an obsession, but there's a sort of trend of uh, you know high quality streaming and the quality of audio getting better, and uh, and I sort of wonder if it kind of you know is is a parallel with that of just like we've had the whole era of convenience and and everything you know, being crushed to, to get to your phone as quickly as possible and, and, and all of that. But maybe, you know, Apple, Apple have always stood for a sort of degree of quality and of taking what's already out there and simply refining it into a better product. Yeah. And I wonder if maybe, you know, they have clocked that there is a, and I think there really is like a yawning gap for a, a marriage between the service provision of, uh, the music and you know uh, infinitely more editorial around it yeah um, although I'd made remarks about this in the digest and a friend of mine Lauren Fintoni who uh, is a journalist and writes for people like fact and, and stuff like that he sort of came back to me and said well you know this is kind of what Bandcamp does at the moment you know, Bandcamp does a lot of editorial and they pay journalists to write about their music and everything and it is you know it's kind of interesting because I went back to him and said look Rightly or wrongly, I don't really view Bandcamp as a streaming service or as a music service in quite the same way as you do yeah. Spotify or Beats or whatever. But 
I think it's a fair point because there's actually a lot of music to stream on Bandcamp. It's just it's done in a sort of thousands of separate band pages yeah. and not really one overarching music service on top of it, if that makes any sense. But, you know, it, he, he certainly raised a fair point that there is good editorial on Bandcamp and they do try and navigate their own offerings, you know, in a manner that doesn't just give you that tyranny of choice problem. But, um, yeah, I'd, I would really like to see this happen, you know, and, and, uh, and the, interesting lovely, thing, you know. the interesting thing is that also, uh, you know, from, from a f the different point of view, uh, a lot of the sites that do r great reviews of music are not doing particularly well financially, at least that, that I'm aware of. And so yeah. it, it'd be interesting, you know, Apple could easily, you know, offer, you know, from a couple of hundred grand to a million or for, for some of the huge ones and actually buy like a whole lot of them if they wanted to. Uh, mm. I mean, it's probably not going to go that way, but it's just interesting to see that the value proposition is, you know, th it, the sites and the content will be so much more valuable to Apple than it is valuable to the sites themselves that are trying to monetize is a standalone content, if that makes any sense. No, uh, I think that's it. You know, it's uh, in the same way, I guess, as music was only there to sell hardware devices, you know, so you could argue that they will uh, put more money toward decent journalism for the same reason. Yeah. Um, that it binds everyone back to the greater win, which is the purchase of an Apple device of some description yeah um so you know I've, i i'm really curious i mean I, i've been very sort of nonplussed about the potential for beats to conquer the market and i think there's too much uh you know assumption that just because apple's got limitless money and um and all these sorts of things that it will automatically knock out spotify you know i, I don't think that's a, a given by any stretch and i yeah. think there are examples in history <laughs> where people have tried that kind of route and it just hasn't worked because you know the end consumer simply hasn't bought into the the proposition you know yeah um but with this development i think it would be a very interesting uh angle to introduce that is absent from spotify and most other services and it does sort of fit with the remit of what beats was about where they'd hired curators you know radio personality they've got zane Lowe now moving to the states to kind of uh, bolster their their you know the team in that way yeah um so it's you know it's, it's certainly very uh very much in line with how they've set everything out to date yeah. so I'm, i'll be really keen to see uh see what comes of it and whether yeah. equally uh anyone we know will get appointed to that job yeah, exactly <laughs> and uh, especially as it's a london-based job so it's more <coughs> likely and uh, staying with that with that line of, of reasoning uh, you're pointing me to a piece that uh, was talking about how uh, how Apple may win over Spotify uh, in in the streaming offering uh, offering that is upcoming, and uh, uh, it, to summarize it very briefly, it was on Fast Company. It talks about how uh, <coughs> the, the streaming offering uh, can live is going to live alongside could live alongside downloads uh, in the Apple ecosystem, and so that would provide uh, artists with a, with a sort of a dual revenues from uh, the streaming and and the downloads that would continue, but also artists will be provided with uh, in depth analytics, uh, uh, which uh, may be linked to the uh, purchase of music metric that happened uh, a few months back and that was already uh, sort of uh, advanced by, by the time it, it leaked uh, and also um, you know uh, the the idea of creating a director fan campaigns off the back of the new streaming service as well which would benefit artists directly so we create a sort of a, a, a pull of gravity towards the new uh, apple service uh, from the point of view of artists in, in a similar way to uh, what uh, apple has done with developers for its uh, app store um, and so but this is a, an interesting direction Apple could take, I guess, you know, presumably with Aaron Rodgers working on the project and, and music metric in the bag. You know, it's something that wouldn't be completely far-fetched, but uh, it would require a very different outlook on, on the whole system. Do you think Apple is the company to bring a new outlook, given how sort of relatively conservative they've been in, in this space so far? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think in theory, it's it's a very interesting proposition, but you're right that I think certainly around music you know apple has not really innovated greatly in a long long time you know itunes was its last big innovation really or probably its only innovation in that space if we're completely honest um so it, it would it would be a very very bold step to introduce something like this if they did and obviously the whole the, the article is is all conjecture it's yeah. worth uh being clear on, you know, I don't think uh, there's any evidence that Apple is sort of considering it. But as you said, you know, certain acquisitions may lend weight, um, I, I guess. But 
I suspect it's that he, he, I don't know. I mean, it, you know, it's one of these where you sort of think, well, in principle, the idea that I could upload my album directly to iTunes and I get all this data and everything else is great. Um, but you know, one could equally sort of say, well, you 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 have the means to do that with things like Topspin. Yeah. And you know, and when the world is uploading all of its music to Apple, it introduces exactly the same issue of getting noticed that you currently have. Yeah. Um, it doesn't really change a great deal in that respect so it's uh it's a tricky one you know i think it's sort of uh, on the face of it appears to be quite an interesting proposition and quite disruptive and everything else but really you're just talking about apple opening a direct to fan element if we're yeah uh, if we want to look at it that way um and so the more i thought about it the more i'm, I'm sort of thinking well you know would people rush to that you know, and there's a huge logistical aspect of it that could become a big headache for apple as well yeah a massive headache and like, and with equally, apps, it, apps everything is is immaterial so it's yeah. easy to transact on that if you start transacting on actual products they need to be delivered by somebody and then apple gets called into the middle of it it becomes it's yeah it becomes a headache but equally you know these days d d the what what would be called a distribution deal you know the distributors you sign with you know people like pias for example people go to to pias because they have a superior uh sales and marketing division you know the the actual supply of the music into itunes there's a million ways to do that you know yeah. tunecore or cd baby or any of these in theory you can go to all of them and they will all put your music on itunes and spotify yeah. but that's not what you are, are, are going to the likes of ps4 it's sales and marketing it's you know and it's not just itunes it's understanding that your product has a relationship to build across all of these different networks worldwide you know and in the context of that you know one could argue that apple is just one yeah. platform you know and and how would one do sales and marketing you know the the actual fact that that you would supply directly wouldn't change the fact that you would still need someone to argue your case yeah so then do you have someone like pias doing it do you have your own label do you have you know like uh, people like i believe domino and beggars you know have the have a direct digital relationship with music suppliers but i would imagine that then means that they have in-house sales and marketing guys that talk to itunes and and do this discussion so yeah. that whole framework i don't think actually changes at all it's the bit the, the only bit that changes is that you would supply directly and they give you lots of pretty graphs and things like that and, and i think data is great um but equally i think there's uh, you know, a limit, and, and there's a, there's still a need to have a firm grasp on where you sit in the general popular culture, yeah. and uh, or even your subculture, which data may not still inform. You know, no, knowing right. whether your record is going to be a hit at radio is perhaps not necessarily a data-led argument, not entirely anyway. Unless you go by Shazam's argument. <laughs> well, Shazam kind of say that, but I mean, Shazam's a bit sort of chicken and egg, isn't it? Yeah. Because you need you need the radio play to see what the reaction is. Yeah, you've got to be on the radio so. for people to start tagging it. <laughs> yeah. So it's a given that you're already at radio, and then yeah. more radio plays equals more tags. So uh, even Shazam, I sort of think, is a little bit cart and horse. <laughs> you know, where it's sitting there saying, "Well, this this got tagged loads," and it's like, "Yeah," because it's all over the radio. So yeah. radio's decided it's picking up heat. I don't need Shazam's tag count to uh, to inform that yeah. really. Um, so I guess yeah, like uh, that they, they just help when it when they see a disproportionate response to a track compared to other tracks that are, are aired for the first time, and then they can tell if it's going to be big or not. But, yeah, yeah. But um, unless the track is is being like is is a big club track, for example, and they can track that being played in clubs, and they can start seeing that sort of bubble up with mm. pop, pop music and sort of radio music, it's so so much more difficult to figure out if somebody's playing it before it yeah. goes on radio, and so yeah. No, that's it. That so makes it's. A lot um, sense. So is it, I mean, I, I sort of like the idea, and I, I'm, I, it, it sort of excited me the notion that that Apple could could start shaking things up with this kind of you know editorial and improved focus on curation and potentially more direct tools for artists and yeah. and those sorts of things all sound really really interesting. Um, and uh, you know, and far more interesting than just sort of rolling out beats to all iTunes users, which. <laughs> You know, it's not that interesting in the grand scheme. It's just another streaming service. So yeah. these are all points of difference, and I think that's good. You know what's depressing is that uh, I found out last night that apparently 23% of uh, 
iTunes users on, on devices, I guess, uh, I don't think it's restricted to mobile, uh, have uh, played a U2 track in the month of January. Uh, which would go towards the argument of saying that actually the Songs of Innocence stunt was actually very successful. If, uh, you know, they have been played, you know, if at least one track has been played by 23% of iTunes users, uh, which is twice as many that have played Taylor Swift tracks in the same period. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I, I keep maintaining that it's people that like shuffle mode and haven't figured out how to get rid of the album. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's possible, uh, uh, I mean, and equally, it's like to what I mean. I still think the sheer overwhelming negative response uh, damaged U 2s image quite severely. I think yeah, because they jumped uh, equally, on this, they jumped on this, and they were like, "Yay, this is great! Isn't this great?" <laughs> one song, uh, you know, we gave them a whole album, and people played one song. Well, sadly, that doesn't suggest that uh, there's been an overwhelming response. Yeah, you know, people, the people have have given the free album you forced upon them one one track of a go <laughs> and then uh, and it's the equivalent to sort of only a quarter of the people that received it doing that yeah. uh, you know I, w I wouldn't i wouldn't consider that a massive win personally it's uh did they like it is the question no one seems to be asking yeah you know, i force a track onto your phone you might check out one song but the question is did you like it and did that connect you more with the band yeah and i think probably the answer is generally a no but who knows? Who knows? Exactly. I mean, we might have they might have found a whole host of new fans for their upcoming world tour. And uh, 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 let's talk about MTV. Let's uh, do a bit of a throwback. So MTV is working hard on updating its image, and uh, you know they have had issues uh, sort of uh, tackling YouTube and Vivos. Uh, uh, you know, up and coming shows which are branching out from just, uh, you know, obviously music for Vivo and uh, Vivo is also doing sort of uh, other types of content which is not just music related, uh, in, in a sense very similar to what MTV started doing uh, back in the day when they started to diversify. And so uh, MTV is uh, 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 launching, has launched a new, a new app in the UK in November which is called MTV Tracks. Uh, the app was totally free, it was powered by Music Cube Ad, uh, but from the uh, 3rd of March is going to be uh, become a paid for app which kind of made sense. Uh, uh, you know, at the time they said that this was an experiment that would last for three months to two or three months, and then it would get essentially the, the idea of, or the, the, the underlying subtext is that it would probably get pulled. But you know, I g gathered that it would it was some sort of pre prelude to a paid uh, subscri subscription service, and this is going to be UK only. Uh, whilst in Germany, Switzerland, and Romania, uh, MTV experimenting with an MTV Play app that will launch on the fifth of March and will provide users with access to. Uh, uh, um, 1,500 plus uh, hours of content, uh, which is on the video side, so all the extra stuff that MTV produces, which will include music and non-music stuff, uh, uh, probably mostly non-music stuff given the MTV's output these days, and mm. uh, it will cost uh, 2 euros 99 per month. So two things for MTV to get back on track, uh, d you know, do you think that uh, they've, they've lost a generation or is it still a big brand for, for, for kids? I am... Um... <laughs> I, I honestly don't know. I mean, I think the problem is that the generation they're targeting has probably only really grown up with MTV not actually doing a lot of music programming. Right. Um, and therefore trying to pull back the discussion in that context is trickier. It's weird, isn't it? Because to people above a certain age, MTV is inherently a music brand. Yeah. But to kids under 15 or under 18, it's possibly much more of a sort of, you know, jackass reality TV type brand where the m has long since stopped standing for music yeah um so i i honestly don't know is, i mean is mtv my, tracks is, is nice I don't, know if, I don't know if you checked out the app uh, for the music one it's actually really nice um it's super pop you know focused it's it's all sort of mainstream uh, pop uh, stuff but you know mm. you can listen to it to the music on, offline it's got quite a big selection and so i think for people that like mainstream music that would be pr a pretty good app to have uh, it's just a question of how do you get people to download it i guess yeah that's the thing i mean i think it's a tricky sell at the best of times because with these things it's convincing them that that's the solution they need you know i think that's the problem we're seeing at the moment though you know we saw it with um uh playstation kind of throwing in the towel on on their streaming service in yeah. favor of using spotify and it is that thing where people are, I mean, you know, it's enough of a mission getting people to pay for these services at all. So now the question is, you know, 
if they're only going to pay for one, which one are they going to pay for and all these sorts of things, you know, which ones will they bond with most? And I think that's where Spotify is kind of sp spotting a, uh, a potential uh, move it can make there by way of becoming the only service that then permeates everything you do. So it yeah. becomes the soundtrack to your game playing on your PlayStation and all these kind of other things. And if people slowly start adopting that because it's everywhere, to what extent do services like this get some degree of pickup? Yeah. And it's, you know, it's it's an interesting one. I mean, one of our clients is Persona, uh, who offer a, you know, they're, they're, they're just launching now and they're kind of a, a penny per stream model. But, you know, they're just in the process of sort of doing their, their, their deals to get all the content on there. So the difference is that they would be uh, packing a catalogue that's quite similar, I think, to Spotify. Um, yeah. But but would cater much more to the sort of casual listener. And I see there being much more of a, uh, a gap in the market for that, where you're picking up, you're giving people access to everything, but at a much more sort of controlled rate and a, and a price point that works for people. Right. Particularly because it's billed through your phone and not through um, a subscription, you know, so there's no sort of credit cards involved and yeah. stuff like that yeah. but all of that makes it much better for the casual people that basically wouldn't ever sign up for spotify yeah whereas things like the mtv app i mean as i said i've not used it but my understanding was more that any of these music cubed uh services are sort of the 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 because the, they did the o2 one as well didn't they yeah. and i think it gave you like the top 40 singles maybe but but nothing else yeah so it was like if all you did was play chart music then actually it was probably a good shout but there was a sort of lack of control because, in theory, if your favourite song dropped out the top forty, it would no longer be available to listen to, yeah. and things like that. So, those kinds of restrictions, I personally struggle a little bit with because I just think people these days want it all or they don't want anything. Yeah, um, and it's how those things are then sold in. And, and I suppose my question is whether MTV's got quite the brand clout among that audience, where I suspect the audience for that would be, you know probably less affluent sort of android users maybe just because i think people that can afford ipods and iphones which are not cheap devices would possibly be more in the market for paying for the likes of spotify yeah so um yeah i, I you know I, I i think it will be interesting to see i mean i'm, I'm more curious about music cubed as a company because they are yeah. picking off these kind of high profile brands to to try and run with and it's whether those then yield much Work back for them you know but i have to say like you know this was was probably one of the best implementations of that concept uh, as far as the design of the app was concerned and and, uh, and sort of the features within that it, it was very well designed and and, and a, a nice app when it when right off the bat when it launched so uh, yeah. uh, i wish them luck when when they go uh, paid for and see what happens there and yeah. uh, uh, talking about uh, sort of making money uh, YouTube changed the, its policy, uh, interestingly, which uh, uh, essentially means that they started clamping down on video creators who directly work with uh, uh, brands and nudging them to rely on Google's sales team uh, for deals instead. So uh, it isn't clear as to whether this policy applies to absolutely everybody, I mean, uh, or if they're targeting especially larger channels, uh, but essentially means that if you have a sponsor that is sponsoring your video and you're doing the deal outside of YouTube, uh, they're gonna be clamping down on you putting the logo of the sponsor and stuff or doing pre-rolls uh, within the video not as part of the YouTube campaign uh, and, and they're going to encourage you to sell to the advertiser through YouTube so they can get a cut. So this is an interesting development because I think for if they implement it across the board, it will really prompt uh, smaller video developers to move away from YouTube potentially. Uh, like I, I certainly would if if they impose that on on, on, on this show, given that it's, it's quite a small, it's a tiny show on YouTube. Uh, mm. uh, but I wonder what the effect is going to be on bigger channels and whether they are going to start thinking, well, actually, if I can do the deals direct with L'Oreal or whatever, if, I'm, if I have like a massive beauty brand, uh, whether I can take my business elsewhere and still retain my, my user base and make money, more money directly from the brands. So I, I don't know. How, how do you think this could play out? Um, I think it's interesting timing because this all comes at a point where certainly from the music side, you know, they're feeling the pinch a little bit. Yeah. You know, the first they had Vivo kind of nipping away at them in, in some respects, although, you know, I think Google has a degree of 
share in their business or whatever, but uh, or certainly gets money from their use because they use Google's technology to serve the videos or yeah. uh, you know whatever the specifics of that are. I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but now you've got Vessel uh, coming up on the outside lane where they're very much focusing only on that kind of top one percent that makes you know eighty five percent of the money, yeah. and are trying to pick them off. And certainly seeing that Universal have now done this deal to deliver videos early to Vessel, uh, you know, it's so that they get greater monetization. And Lucian Grange, when he was interviewed last week at the the uh, Recode Media conference, was making quite clear that you know ad ad supported structures were, were never going to you know, support the industry as a whole. You know, it needed to be more than that. Hence the Vessel deal that was announced on the same day. But all of that makes for an interesting sort of context around YouTube then clamping down on these sorts of things. Yeah. Because you wonder the degree to which it plays into the hands of people like Vessel. Uh, and, you know, and I think there are other companies also targeting these MCNs to try and pick off the biggest players and offer them uh, a slightly more robust deal where, you know, they do deal with them directly. Yeah. And having said that, I I kind of sympathise a little bit because I think there is a degree of, uh, you know, it's it's it, it does strike me as a bit of a liberty to some extent that people are using YouTube's platform for free uh, and then taking money from L'Oreal uh, and sort of cutting out YouTube in the process for hosting millions of views of videos. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's an extreme example because I'm pretty sure all of these would also carry advertising and uh, would generate money in some respect for for YouTube, but. You know, if it was me and I was hosting that service for people and they were going off and doing much more lucrative deals with yeah. big brands that I wasn't getting a cut of, uh, I would probably be equally annoyed. So um, I, I do sort of sympathize with their plight, but at a point when there are other companies who are very keen to pull away these yeah. kind of MCNs <laughs> and uh, and get them on their services, it, it, it strikes me as a, a slightly dubious time to make that announcement. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, after that, I think we could actually start winding down. Uh, I wanted to uh, talk about a feel-good story, uh, which uh, is the fact that uh, the GoFundMe page uh, set up by uh, the UK DJ Martin Webster to give something back to uh, Richard L. Spencer, who is a surviving songwriter responsible for the Winston's Aim and Break, uh, has hit, uh, I think now, 12 to 12 thousand or almost 13,000 actually uh, right now uh, in donation uh, in just a week essentially uh, uh, so this is great because Spencer never received a penny royalties from the use of the recording and uh, uh, when he found out uh, about the extent of the tracks sampling uh, uh, back in uh, 96 uh, uh, he, you know the statute of limitation had run out and so he couldn't actually claim any of that money uh, at all uh, and so uh, just a nice feel good story uh, to mm. see how crowdfunding can help uh, somebody who has been uh, uh, you know left out in the cold by the by the system because of you know various circumstances yeah i mean i, I love that story i thought it was great to see it, it left me wondering when like clyde stubblefield and jabo starks and all of james brown's drummers are going to start getting what's, what's due because certainly clyde stubblefield i remember reading an interview with him where you know he's, he's the funky drummer so he's the funky drummer break was was clyde and uh, and obviously jabo has done my favorite ever break on give it up or turn it loose which it, he sounds like a rhino on the charge it's like the hardest funkiest break you've ever heard and both of them got nothing for that and so um yeah amid a, a, a plethora of uh, you know negative stories within or without music uh yeah. it's just nice to see that someone finally stood up and said you know what i mean given i, I would imagine it would be tough to chart how many times the amen break has been used across music but specifically jungle and drum and bass in particular uh you know I think 12,000 even drops a little bit short. You know, yeah. If you got a penny from every song, he'd be owed hundreds of thousands. So, um, yeah, I, I, it's it's great to see. It's, you know, it's a nice times story. like that, the internet, you sort of think, maybe it's not such a septic whirlpool. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And and uh, finally, the UK, mu UK Music, which is a campaigning and lobbying group, which represents both the recording and the live music industry, has released a manifesto for 2015. So if you're interested in sort of UK copyright and, and music and, and all sorts of policies, uh, you can go uh, on, on the UK Music site and, and read more about their manifesto. But essentially, uh, they uh, wanted to ensure that uh, music was on the uh, next government's agenda so that whoever part Party one essentially had a clear idea of where the uh, uh, creative industries stood in that respect uh, and sort of could uh, create uh, an agenda that reflected uh, those sentiments uh, uh, if 
they wanted to take them up essentially you know so this is these are only suggestions from a lobby group so it's not a, a nothing that the government has to stick to uh, and, and you know they, they talked about uh, you know uh, fostering a strong corporate framework uh, uh, they wanted obviously to change the uh, disliked uh, uh, system that was introduced uh, a few months a uh, few months back uh, uh, where uh, there was no uh, compensation for the private copy, pro- copying exception that was introduced uh, they want fair compensation for that uh, also uh, it's advocating for better access to finance and f- fiscal initiatives uh, through UK tax breaks uh, for the industry uh, you know funding for momentum and other initiatives that are going on in the UK to support the music industry and, and all that kind of thing so it's it's a it's a good uh, uh, outline of what the creative uh, the music industry would like to see the governments do uh, uh, it's not necessarily something everybody will agree on but uh, you know what can you do that's that's the job of uh, UK music yeah I mean it's you know it's it's good that they're outlining that stuff it's I suppose the the uh, the trick though is, is is that someone pays due attention to it and tries to act on it you know yeah, I think exactly. As we as we edge closer to a general election, you know, many many sort of industry and pressure groups and all these sorts of things are going to come forward and start sort of setting out their uh, manifestos of what they want to see happen. And it's a it's another uh, well, a cynic like me might say it's a sort of you know a chance for politicians to score points. So probably Labour, I would imagine, and the Green Party yeah. will come forward and say we completely agree with you and everything else, and the Tories will pretend it's not there. Uh, <laughs> but it's good that they do it. Um, I yeah. just hope someone pays attention. Due attention. To yeah, because yeah. that's at the end of the day, it's uh, that's the bit that makes the difference. Not, it's not, it's not the, it's not the demand. It's seeing it met is, yeah. is where the difference lies. So fingers Absolutely. crossed. Absolutely. And uh, as we wind down the show, I wanted to mention that if anybody out there is going to South by Southwest, I'm not going to be there. But if you are going to be there and you think you might have a few minutes uh, to dedicate to calling me in and telling me what's going on there, then uh, please do get in touch. I would uh, love to have a few uh, reporters out there or people calling in uh, via Skype and just letting me know what's been going on and uh, what their view of this year's uh, South by was. And Darren, anything going on your end? Uh, I guess no South by but uh, uh, what's what, what's happening? Uh, no, no South by. Um, <laughs> South by is one of those things where it's great. Like if someone else is paying for it, yes. now I own the company. I don't get that. <laughs> it's, know, it's my money now. So yeah, no South by. No South by. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't get to go on the big barbecue gig beano that uh, certain colleagues uh, of mine do. Barbecue. Uh, but no, we've, we've got quite a lot going on. Um, you know, we. Uh, are just growing extensively now so we're, we're working with uh, other brands including a headphones brand called Audizy who are doing amazing headphones that I had a chance to trial recently um, nice. they're about £700 a pair so Ooh. they're not for the faint hearted but believe me they do sound like £700 headphones should um, but <laughs> no we're better. doing a lot of good campaigns <laughs> as well uh, across the board so we're now working with anyone from Jack Savaretti and the Charlatans to uh, nice. the Backstreet Boys weirdly we're now working with is, uh, <laughs> you hadn't told me that <laughs> yeah so that's uh, you know that's one of our newest clients uh, awesome so we, you know we're doing lots of things but it's it's really interesting because it's a broad spectrum of stuff and yeah. uh, I'm really enjoying the fact that we're taking on more and more kind of um, pop led stuff uh because it just um it's a very different world to market to so uh between that and taking on tech clients like the sonar and headphones brands like audizy and stuff like that you know we're growing really well as a company so it's uh presenting a lot of very positive challenges along the way but uh, awesome. i'm loving it it's and you can cool. find everything on multivanknown.com and you can also subscribe to darren's uh, uh newsletter uh, which goes out uh, almost daily uh, depending on the news cycle but uh, uh, and it's fantastic called the daily digest and uh, uh, also next week it's uh, on sundays is it the brits this week uh am i dreaming it tonight it? tonight yeah wednesday it's it's tonight how did i miss that <laughs> Yeah, no, well, actually, I've just realised I've missed the fact that uh, it's tonight and Alt J are nominated. So, oh, uh, nice. We we'll see. We still work with Alt J. Um, they haven't to... come to their senses yet, <laughs> and uh, so they are. Uh, they're, they're nominated. Uh, I, nice. I, uh, call me a cynic, but I suspect the evening will end with pretty much Sam Smith and Ed Sheeran just having everything. But no, uh, really. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, I, I, uh, I'm perhaps not holding my breath on Alt J walking away with an award because uh, I'm not sure their faces quite fit for the Brits, but. We'll see. 
You never I know. I live in hope. It would be a beautiful turnaround if uh, if they did, just to see the look on uh, on Ant and Dex faces. Uh, so maybe uh, maybe the Brits will decide that they want to pull a Grammys on the on the best album. And yeah, <laughs> you, you never know, right? It's uh, <laughs> that that would be a sweet moment. So yes. uh, I'll be watching at home. Uh, I won't be at the Brits, sadly, but. Um, uh, and also because I'm, I'm or not so sadly. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, or not so sadly. Uh, but also because I'm, I'm currently taking these bloody pills for a, an yeah. inner ear infection. I can't drink. So uh, unlike last year, where I appeared to that would be really consume too much alcohol and took to Twitter very vocally. This year, I will be uh, just at home with a, a, a sparkling mineral. Still water, taking perhaps. to Twitter. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, I need to watch myself. I think last year yeah. I came within a hair's breadth of uh, upsetting people that pay me. So, um, yeah, maybe not. We'll watch this space. Yeah, uh, yeah. you need like a, 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 a two-level authorization for tweets <laughs> on these occasions. Are you sure? Are you really sure? I should have Lucy as like a sort of authorizing my tweets for me so that when I'm, yeah. when I'm in, in mid spew, she can just uh, say no. It's like on, that, G- it's like on that, Gmail that. when you mention an attachment and then it tells you, you've mentioned an attachment, but you haven't actually attached anything. Are you sure you want to send <laughs> yeah. this email? Do you, do you really want to call these people that, Darren? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yes, excellent. Cool. All right, cool. Then, then I'm going to be watching that tonight. Uh, uh, and it should be fun. Excellent. I was I was torn whether to go to the last. Uh, uh, in the UK, we have this thing called uh, uh, Orange Wednesdays, which was like a two for one for our cinemas, which is like a staple of UK cinema viewership. Yeah. Uh, and it's the last night because apparently the sponsor, which is a telco, decided that it's it wasn't as good a deal anymore to sponsor cinema because people I don't know don't like it anymore. There's better ways to spend their money. I'm not sure what they decided, but yeah. So yeah, that that was the other plan for tonight. But I, I think I'm going to stick with the Brits at this point. Yeah, awesome. Well. Well, thank you so much for joining me uh, today, Darren, and thanks for listening to the show uh, every week, uh, as usual, on digitalmusictrends.com. You find the latest news and some interesting conversations. We've been talking about copyrights in uh, episodes 119 and 100, uh, sorry, 219 and 220, so if you do want to go and check out the episodes on US reform of copyright, go and check those out. Uh, the first half is essentially dedicated to that subject. Thanks so much for listening. Have a fantastic week, and until uh, next time. 